theory and practice of human rights so that we can uh, get the people. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I know that it's uh, after lunch time, so we will try to be uh, short, concrete, inspiring. So we will not lose chairs. <laughs> Just think. Okay. So human rights uh, for internet users. A few years ago, internet uh, was not considered relevant for human rights. If someone or civil society was trying to advocate and saying that internet rights are human rights and that human rights are everywhere and we need a framework and we need to look at internet and ICTs from this perspective and lenses were just out oh, the usual, they want always to bring uh, uh, their issue, they want always to bring the troubles. But it's uh, been a long way and in the last uh, two, three years, had been very important decision and statement regarding the relevance of internet rights as human rights in different fields. Not only about the massive uh, surveillance, not only about the privacy, but so many. So since we're going to talk uh, around the realities uh, that we have in the region, I think it's due, been coming from Bosnia, to just tell some of the little things that happen in some of our country. So I think that at the stage, the podium, has to go to Macedonia with the scandal of mass surveillance, 20,000 citizens, so, and all the protests that are uh, happening. And yesterday seems a decision, a sort of agreement, but there are a lot of uh, concern. So Macedonia, internet rights, activists, and the target to the freedom of expression that is spreading all around. Serbia had also several issues during the last floods different issue of censorship, several issues of uh, uh, bloggers bring to, to, to jail because they were agitating and creating troubles. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, a recent law on public, uh, on public uh, order that uh, is saying, defining internet as a public uh, space, a space where if I tweet, I can be responsible because I can generate troubles. So. These are three examples from three countries. The Southeast Europe is uh, wider. But just to understand how the, the, theo the practical uh, impact on people's lives is there, is every day, and uh, you know, doesn't uh, just uh, touch uh, the important people, but uh, just touch any single citizen or person that try to advocate and to do something. To do not forget, uh, internet is a place of violence, violence against girls, against women. Anytime you you try to do something or to say something, former partner will try to revenge using uh, uh, hacking your Facebook account to make sure that you will not find a job, that you will not get uh, maybe the children custody and so on. So this is a bit of reality, but I think it's important to listen from our uh, speaker. I would like to invite uh, Elvana Tacci to have an overview from the Council of Europe, which has provided several frameworks, thinking it's important to have a common framework. framework. So we start from the theoretic, theoretical approach that maybe we can use in our challenge realities. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. yes? Um, 
also, uh, thanks for having me in the panel. Um, we are getting the gender balance more and more right, I think, in the panels. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about the Council of Europe's Guide um, on Human Rights for Internet Users. Um, how we developed this, this document, uh, what was the rationale for it, uh, and what does it contain. But before I do that, I will just start where you started, Valentina, with the statement that human rights don't apply to the internet, and not many people know that human rights apply to the internet, um, and, and that there is no human rights law applicable to, to the internet. Um, this statement is, has been circulating indeed for a long time around, but it's so unfounded and it's so untrue. Um, there is at least the European Convention on Human Rights, which uh, is fully applicable uh, to the internet, and it applies in the same way as it does to the, um, to the offline, to the physical um, environment. So, um, the guide. Um, the, re the reflection in the Council of Europe before we started, we embarked in the, in the process of developing the guide, was that um, in real life, users are not aware of their rights on the internet. They are not aware what are their fundamental freedoms on the internet, what are the limits um, to their freedoms, and when can they be, these freedoms be legitimately uh, constrained. Um, the reflection was that basically these uh, rights and freedoms are being governed by the, the contracts, the terms of services of internet providers, and users, um, by just clicking uh, and accepting the terms of services, were basically giving away some of their rights uh, without understanding what they were doing. Um, users also didn't, even in those few cases when users knew what their rights were, they were not able to understand where to go if they felt that their rights had been violated. So this was the reflection um, that triggered the idea to, to work on, 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 on human rights of internet users. Um, we cooperated very closely with the dynamic coalition of the Internet Governance Forum on Rights and Principles. Um, this was um, a constellation of NGOs, uh, of people, if you will, a gathering, uh, a loose, uh, not formalized gathering of, of people and NGOs who had developed a charter of uh, rights and principles um, uh, for the Internet. So this was also an inspiration for our work. Then, in the Council of Europe, we got a mandate from the ministers, from the Committee of Ministers, which is the highest decision-making body. Uh, of the organization to develop a compendium of existing human rights for internet users. We created an expert committee, um, which was in, in design, it was multi-stakeholder, as it had seven representatives of member states and six uh, independent experts who came from civil society, from private sector, um, but mostly from, from, uh, from civil society. We worked for two years um, on to develop the guide, and uh, we had various rounds of consultations with um, uh, with um, people outside of the committee. Uh, we posted the drafts online. Um, we consulted in fora such as this one in Eurodic and the Internet Governance Forum. Um, we collected comments and we tried to uh, integrate them uh, into the text. Um, the um, the, the, the guide was adopted by the governments, by the 47 governments, in April um, 2014. Now, as to the substance, what is the guide? Um, it has been designed as a tool to help internet users uh, to understand their rights and freedoms online and to exercise their rights and freedoms online. Um, it provides information on how international human rights law, especially the European Convention on Human Rights, but also other substatutory, if you will, uh, standards of the Council of Europe apply to, to the Internet. It has two, two purposes, um, to raise the awareness of, of users, as I said, about human rights and fundamental freedoms, but also to serve as a reference point, as a reference document for um, activities um, at a national level, at a regional level, or activities such as this one, 
to inspire um, discussions and thinking um, and dialogue at the national level. Um, the nature of the document is such that it does not create any new rights, it explains existing rights. Um, for example, access to, to the internet, whether this is a right or not, I'll come to that a bit later. Um, we didn't think that this uh, should be um, uh, stated as a right in, in the document because the, there is no international consensus yet or national uh, consensus in, in, every, in every state. Um, the document is written in a very user-friendly uh, language. Um, it is simple, it's trying to explain the uh, legal intricacies of international human rights law uh, and other standards in, in a very simple and digestible um, uh, format for the user. Um, it has a, a, a couple of, of sections starting with access to the internet and here I'd like to, to stop for a while. As I said, um, there was no consensus to consider this as a fundamental right standing on its own, but rather as an enabler for the exercise of other fundamental rights and freedoms such as access to information, freedom of expression, freedom of thought as well. Um, freedom of assembly and association, freedom of religion, um, uh, uh, the right to vote. So all these rights can be enabled by the um, by access to to the internet. Um, so we didn't assert a right to access the internet as a technology, but. There, the guide emphasizes the role of the state not to interfere with access, not to disconnect users um, from the internet, for example, for, uh, for, for an infringement of, of intellectual property or whatever infringement uh, might, be, uh, might be deemed necessary, simply because disconnection from the internet, in any case, it is disproportionate. Uh, is a disproportionate interference with, uh, with freedom of expression and other fundamental rights and freedom, freedoms. Um, the section on access to the internet also emphasizes the non-discriminatory aspects. Um, it states that everyone should be able to access the internet equally without uh, distinction, without discrimination based on gender, on location, on um, on disability, people who, who, uh, who have disabilities should be also able to access the internet. In respect of freedom of expression, here the emphasis uh, is to is on informing the user about the balance between freedom of speech, a freedom to create, to post, to uh, to use content online, and on on the one hand, and on the other hand, the responsibility of users not to engage in unlawful um, speech, uh, such as hate speech or unlawful uh, or, or distribution or, or of unlawful content. Um, the guide also informs the user about uh, blocking and filtering as two forms of, two ways of interfering with access to information and freedom of expression. The limits um, for these two measures to be taken um, uh, and that these measures should comply with international law whenever they are applied either by uh, state or non-state actors. Um, in respect of freedom of association, the guide informs the user um, about the ability uh, to use any application, any website, any ICT to associate with others, to organize a gathering, a protest, a peaceful protest, um, to organize a, a party, to engage, uh, to create a trade union or whichever form of association without, without uh, enumerating them in an exhaustive way. Privacy is also a central um, a section of the, of the guide. Um, the, the guide on this aspect raises users' awareness that every activity that they carry online um, basically leaves some traces uh, on the internet and there is disclosure of personal information about personal lives, about preferences, about convictions, even political convictions. So users should be aware that um, they leave traces about all these aspects which can be used to create profiles for them, and then they are not—they don't know how how these profiles are going to be used uh, for or against them. 
Also, the users are informed about their right to uh, request a correction or deletion of personal information when they think that um, the, the, the legal requirements for collecting and processing their data have not been, uh, have, have not been uh, respected. There is a section on the right to education uh, and, and information and digital literacy, which is also very important. Um, and there, this section focuses on the ability of users to um, use research materials um, for, for education purposes. There is a, a very targeted section on the rights of children and, and young people. This is very specific because it really addresses a, 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 an age group that is, um, has specific needs. Um, and it's drafted, it's, it's written in a very simple way. This section informs the users about the right, to, not only the right to be protected from harmful activities such as child pornography or bullying or harassment or other um, other um, intimidation or other uh, harmful activities, but also empowerment of children. Uh, their right to participate, to, to express um, their views, um, and, the, and their right to be heard whenever a decision is taken uh, that will affect, uh, affect them. Um, in the last section, um, we elaborate on the right to an effective remedy. So, if all these uh, rights have been, which I, I just uh, went through very quickly, have been violated, or um, if, if a user considers that they have been violated, um, the user should be able to address the internet company, first of all, and to uh, seek redress. Um, and there should be a process, a due process, in this interaction between the user and the company. Um, in addition, the user should be able to address national authorities um, to, um, uh, to to seek redress if, if there has been a failure in the previous process. Um, the guide also, um, not in its text that was adopted, but there is a report which explains all the details of, of the guide, encourages uh, the creation of inventories of remedies at a national level on a country by country basis and the publication of this inventory so that people know which is the data protection authority, for example, to address, what is the address, what is the physical location, what is the email address uh, whereby they can be contacted. Um, uh, is there a hotline, for example, to protect children uh, and children's rights? So um, this is the, the approach that has been encouraged uh, to, to create inventories of effective, uh, of, of remedies offered at the national level. Now, this is the text of the guide. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, are not able to make it available today, but tomorrow it will be available in the Council of Europe stand. It has been translated into 10 languages. Um, uh, I don't have the list with me now, but please visit the Council of Europe stand and you'll see, that, see it there. Um, we are now developing an action plan to promote the guide in, um, in our uh, 47 member states. Um, there are already some activities going on, for example, um, children in Spain, they have developed their own version, their own interpretation of the guide, um, and uh, this has been published. Um, there, there will be follow-up activities, I, I don't have the specifics, but I have a colleague sitting over there who can provide you more details um, and can answer any questions if, if, uh, if there will be. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So very comprehensive. Uh, and uh, you have seen like a user are a, have a dual citizenship because they're citizens of their country and they are also citizens of the internet. So Georgi Dimitrov, Internet Law and Foundation Bulgaria, how is to be from the side of law to be citizens of these two places? Um, I'd like to stand up. <coughs> I know it's very difficult uh, for everyone after the lunch to stay awake. It's uh, even more challenging for the speakers to stay awake, but not only stay awake, for a lawyer it's even more challenging because uh, to speak only 10 minutes for a lawyer, it's, it's a torture. But I will try to be, <laughs> to be very, very short. Uh, I would like to give you, you know, to shake a little bit the tree and to give you some uh, uh, point of view on the internet with the glasses of a lawyer. Hmm? And uh, because uh, the internet as a new realm comes with so many 
um, new relations in the society that I, I would like to uh, put a question to you whether the society is ready. Should it regulate the relations in internet or use it by using internet? And to what extent the use of internet may hamper, may infringe the, the, the human rights? So uh, a part of access to information, privacy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of which uh, of which Alvana spoke about, I will uh, just need, uh, I will just give you some very practical uh, issues to put your attention on these, and uh, if uh, there there would be interest, we can discuss the, these, of course. Let's take uh, uh, very simple instruments that we use every day in our work. For example, spam filters. You know, spam filters, uh, if I say these words, everyone knows what spam, spam filters mean. I mean, without the spam filters, we are dead. You know, I, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, the statistics shows that uh, 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 a Gmail account, which is, uh, which, which is of three years, three years, will receive between 600 and 800 spams per day. Without the spam filter, it will take a huge amount of, of, of time just to review that the message is a spam and to delete it. At least five to 10 seconds. 600 messages by 10 seconds, I don't want to calculate how much time. It is more than one and a half hours per day or more than 15% of the time of, of people each one of us to respawn messages and to delete. I mean, just one of these. The overall eaten amount of of the of the of the of the time which people would otherwise work to generate GDP for the country, it it is huge. It affects a lot the society. So without the spam filters, we cannot imagine even our life. I cannot imagine mine. But what does how? How do spam filters work? Have you ever tried to, uh, do you have any idea? Well, most of them, of course, they, uh, they employ different techniques, but the most uh, relevant technique is to filter the message based on different words. Say, I will give an example because it's a very practical example. If you put, and you can try it, of course, everyone can try it. If you put three words, Viagra, sex, and girl, these particular three words, and send the message to 100 people, 60% will not receive this message. It will be filtered as a spam. Now I will take a look with the, with, the, with the eyes of the lawyer and say, who gives the right of someone to filter my message, which may have very sensitive information addressed to my girlfriend? Hey girl, I have bought Viagra, and tonight, uh, you know, who gives a right? Who gives a? Are you happy with someone to filter your messages based on content? Do you know by that even technologically autom in automated regime, based on different words, with 90%, someone can guess what is the content of the message. The content of the message. So if we turn to Declaration of Human Rights or the European Convention of Human Rights, right of privacy of communication is a must. No one, no one, I mean, no one can reveal the secrecy of the message. The chances of revealing the secrecy, even working in automated regime, is much higher than if, if, uh, it, if it's, not, uh, it's made by hand, because uh, most of the messages are stored in uh, folders, you know, <laughs> spam folders, which usually the system administrators, they review. So who gives the right? You will say that, of course, I give a right, well, I install my spam filter. I give a, a consent that spam filter is installed in my mailbox. But does the sender has given his consent? Hmm? So uh, it is a very questionable whether the spam filter is illegal at all. At all. It's a technical instrument. We can only, cannot live without that. But is it legal? Does it affect human rights? Can a spam filter filter a message which is not a spam? Are they a panacea? Are they work all the time 100% through spam filters? They may, 
and this, uh, this happens many times with me, I don't know about you, but I'm sure it is the same the case, when uh, a, a solicited message is filtered as a spam. And if this message is, uh, for example, as a lawyer, I can uh, deliver a message to the government, or I deliver a message to my client, which, with, with, with which I fulfill my obligations, I, my duties under the contract, can this spam filter hamper my relation between my client, which is purely obligation, contractual relation? I would, I would, I, I'm, this is a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that everyone would agree that it might. And in all the jurisdiction, whatever I have read, there is a general rule saying that no one, no one can intentionally hamper the, uh, the, the relation between, contractual relation between two people to, to be fulfilled. So uh, this, uh, I just give, uh, let's say, give, give rise to some, uh, some thoughts about uh, the legality of different technical instruments. Same refers to the block list or the so-called blacklist. You know how blacklists work? If, for example, you, uh, you are identified as a spammer, your IP address is blocked and no emails can you, you can receive, nor you can send any emails whatsoever. Even there is a whole technology protocols based on so-called DNSBL protocol. These are servers which, which uh, sync information between different blacklists so that uh, everyone can block your messages. And I will give you a very practical example with my own experience. Uh, uh, in the past, our uh, domain name at DPC of our law firm was uh, hosted by another mail server which was at lex.bg. It's another public, uh, uh, public uh, mail server which everyone uh, could open free mail account. They have the same IP address. Hmm? And one of the users of at lex.bg has spammed everyone. everyone. Of course, the IP address of lex.bg was blocked. And our law firm, which has nothing to do with lex.bg, stopped receiving any communication. Can you imagine for the, for the business of a firm, someone just to stop the messages to you and from you? It's a nightmare. My hands are shaking. You know, it was, uh, it was unbelievable problem. We lost clients. Please convince your client that you have sent the message on time. I have sent it. He said, yeah, 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 you have sent it, of course. I mean, no one would believe you. So practically, uh, <laughs> you know how, how long it takes to be taken out of, of blacklist? It's, it's a nightmare. It took more than three, three months to be with uh, all uh, notary notices and uh, legal you know, tricks to, to be taken out of all the spam filters, whatever they are. Uh, believe me, spa filters, they do absolutely the same. They may hamper relations, they may impede, they may infringe your rights, the rights to, to, to information, secrecy of information. They may influence the relations between uh, parties, legal relations between parties, and they, it's, it's not regulated. Does, I, I, I ask a question because I know the answer, but you know also the answer. Is the, the society, the, does the state need to regulate these issues? Okay. Let's, or they shouldn't? Let's, before to go yes. to the state, let's listen uh, from Bogdan Manolea what the, the, tech, the tech community says. Maybe it was by technology. Maybe there are, there are better plays. Uh, I don't know if the tech community says, but uh, I would answer no, actually, to your question. Despite your pro um, not blocking or blocking spam uh, filters, but actually we run uh, uh, blocking uh, spam filters, and without it, you would be lost. And uh, you can also argue that because of your personal data, your email is a personal data, and it shouldn't be used for uh, hundreds of companies to send you uh, thousands of unsolicited emails. So it's a, it's a very complete solution. But as long as you give the tool to the user, uh, 
uh, and the user is, is well aware of that, I think you solve most of the problem. Uh, but because we are a part of a, a digital civil rights organization, I wanted to, to tackle a bit differently the issue of human rights in, in information society because we all love the nice words from uh, the human rights treaties and from the uh, from the human rights guides that are produced by the Council of yes. Europe but, yes but they have one major problem uh, that is they are recommendations unfortunately so that means that a lot of the member states adopt them very quickly they are very happy with them because they can say yes we protect human rights on the internet and they then go home and they do nothing nothing to protect the human rights on the internet so and you see in all the case law of the European Court of Human Rights that there are more and more cases being brought to, to this to this court and by the way we're eagerly expecting for the uh, Delphi uh, solution by the by the grand jury of the European Court of Human Rights so I think the uh, we need to, to shift a bit the discussion from theoretical to practical issues. And I will give you a practical uh, situation that happened in Romania like three weeks ago. It's the most recent case, just to highlight how complicated the situation might be and why we should think about it. So we all talked about, and the European Commission talks about free, uh, free access to the internet, that anyone needs to have access to the internet. But what kind of internet are we offering? Is it an internet which is filtered by someone or is an internet which is actually has all the content that should be there uh, and where do you place the middlemen so the hosting companies or the uh, or other companies and this example goes with uh, uh, a major uh, classified website uh, where you can post announcements and you can post announcements of everything like selling cars to selling whatever you want and it's, they also have a newspaper and by the way they have one section that is uh, related to um, uh, how do you call that? Um, let's say matrimonial services. But in the matrimonial services, they had a subsection called partners, where anyone could say, you know, I'm looking for a partner, uh, so on and so forth. And there, there were also some uh, ladies and also men who were offering services to, uh, to other uh, persons. So they had a lot of classifiers related to that. Now, they were just hosting the classifieds. You could actually, you could do that automatically. They would appear on the website. And um, in Romania now, prostitution is a misdemeanor, so it's not a crime. But uh, aiding uh, to, to do uh, prostitution uh, is a crime. So these guys have done that from uh, 1990. They did it on paper, and now they are doing also on the internet. And they, one day, they received an uh, unexpected criminal police investigation in their uh, 18 offices, all at the same time. So police bumping in, uh, telling them that we need to investigate your computers because you are uh, uh, helping um, um, a network of, uh, of people that are uh, are actually uh, helping uh, prostitutes to go to go on. And they said, why? Why do you want to do that with us? I mean, we've already cooperated with police. We already gave you the details of the people who posted announcements if you asked us uh, legally to do so. And they said, no, 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 you're responsible for that. So then you need to do that and you need to give us all the information. So of course they gave the information, but they also are now accused from a criminal point of view. So you have the company, which is criminally liable now in Romania, but also the uh, two, um, two people that were working in the company that are criminally um, uh, charged with, with uh, aiding uh, prostitution, which is for them like, why do you want to keep us? And to make even things worse, then you get to the court and the prosecutor asks for the court to block that specific uh, subsection of the website. So, of course, and the court says, yes, you need to block the subsection of the website. Of course, the company says, yes, we'll block it. So the subsection partners in the matrimonial section does not exist anymore. What happens? Well, all the ads are moving to a different section. Another announcement. I mean, you don't solve the problem in this way. And, and these are the, uh, the practical things that need to be taught on a wide area of professionals uh, and not only professionals, so starting with internet users and ending up with judges, to understand that uh, internet is not like a newspaper. It's not something where you can say, yes, you can stop that, you can stop the print, you can uh, get all the copies, and so on and so forth. It's actually much more complicated uh, from this point of view. And it also shows you that, uh, that these kind of cases uh, appear more and more often. Uh, and, uh, um, especially in the area of freedom of expression, which is also this case, uh, it, it brings interesting questions to where is the limit of what you can publish and what you cannot publish, and what is the responsibility of uh, you as the as the hoster of the message uh, or or you as the poster of the message, which which makes things much uh, very complicated on a on a practical level. 
Thank you. Any comment, anyone that want to jump in? Otherwise, I would like to listen from uh, Rade Dragovic. When, uh, when the state should, uh, should come in, or uh, how the state or uh, a public institution are called to, to defend human rights, to balance human rights, uh, to, to be part of the conversation. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am glad that I am here in Sofia on uh, Eurodig conference and that I have a possibility to speak about this important subject uh, with you today. I am first time in Sofia and uh, very nice people and a very, very be beautiful city. Over the past uh, 30 years, the internet has brought together over 2 billion people worldwide and has influenced all spheres of social, economics, and political life faster and uh, in a more profound way uh, than any other technology up to date. It has truly become the backbone of the modern society and its critical infrastructure. With millions of new users uh, getting online each day and with increased usage of internet of on mobile uh, platforms, the influence of internet and its importance continues to grow. Uh, countries of the, our region have an obligation to support human rights on the basis of various uh, Uni United Nations, United Nations uh, conventions and uh, conventions from Council of Europe. Uh, countries in region generally have adopted laws on electronic communications, privacy and access to information in line with uh, European Union uh, regulation. However, the implementation of these uh, regulations vary from country to country and the major problem is that in practice it is very hard to enforce the law in question. This does not apply only to the executive institutions, but also the judi judiciary owns, uh, due to very slow procedures as evidenced by numerous judgment uh, of the European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg. We see more attempts of political parties, tycoons and criminal circles to indire indirectly control or directly by the public uh, discourse via bots, online media, uh, by targeting campaigns, etc. Uh, access to information on international level has been for a long period of time recognized as, uh, as the basic human rights. <laughs> And uh, on the other hand, the digital world, primarily the governmental administration, they have the opportunity to help uh, its usage in practice. The e-government is the best and the most transparent way to enable human rights of citizens doing business and to enable <laughs> the government itself to function better. So. Uh, Serbian institutional framework is uh, then we have National Assembly and the Committee of Education, Science, Technological Devel Development and the Information Society. Second, second uh, level is governmental level and we have directorate for e-government inside Ministry of Public Administration and local self-government. Uh, we have a Department for Information Society in the Ministry of Trade, Tourism and Telecommunication. And inside the Ministry of Interior, we have Department for Information Technology that is uh, development, uh, with development role. But we have a Department for High Tech uh, Crime. Uh, that's the Department for Supporting is Investigations. And we have other government bodies, Serbian National Internet Domain Registry, Regulatory Agency for Electronic Communications, our future uh, official CERT, 
during ongoing government multi-ministerial uh, work group for the preparation of law about information security. We have commissioner for information of public importance and personal data protection, departments for uh, information technology inside the governmental bodies. Uh, third level or third pillar is judiciary. We have special prosecutor for high-tech crime and on the court level we have department for the fight against, uh, against uh, high-tech crime in high court in Belgrade, that's the first level. And second level is appellate court in Belgrade, jurisdiction on second level. So, NGO, like our uh, next pillar, uh, NGO like uh, citizen organized, but NGO by business organized, like Chamber of Commerce and other business-based organizations, uh, then uh, significantly contribute to the analyze of the actual situation and expectation, experience of other countries in uh, this area. So our vision is uh, then for successful uh, future development of uh, e-government and human rights of, uh, for internet users, we need to resist the pressure of uh, e-bureaucracy <coughs> and influence on uh, other and non-human rights based interest groups and insist on, on mandatory documents, laws, bylaws, standards and procedures in the same timeline with progress of internet technologies. It's a very comprehensive uh, approach. I don't know uh, if for the other countries, what is the experience? Are your countries also having uh, all this system in play now? How easy is for children, for, uh, internet user and citizen to, to, to approach it and to use. I know that in Bosnia we are just moving probably the first steps. It's not still so sophisticated, the system. Any comment from the, yes? No, sorry, okay. <laughs> okay, so if there are no comments, we have listened to many stories from uh, Southeast Europe, so Chris Sherwood, Allegro Group, Belgium. What, does, what do you do in these internet uh, realities? Thank you. So I, I am uh, not a human rights expert, and although I live in Belgium, uh, my company is, is not uh, active in Belgium, but in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so I can comment uh, not as an expert on, on human rights, but as a, from an industry perspective on what's being said. Um, my company represents some of the leading e-commerce businesses in Southeastern Europe, including EMAG, OLX, Autovit, and PayU in Romania, uh, and Compar. Um, uh, EMAG in Bulgaria, OLX in uh, Bosnia, uh, and Markafoni in, in Turkey. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to th when we think about human rights and, and, and companies and how they uh, how they act in this space. It's important to look at the two major frameworks which exist. The first one is, of course, the Council of Europe framework with the um, ECHR as, as the backup. Um, and then, of course, you have the European Union framework. And I think the interesting thing about the European Union framework is that it um, goes further and implements some of the Council of Europe principles into economic and other uh, policy instruments and, and, and legislation. Uh, in a way that Council of Europe is, is unable to do. Um, and uh, this European Union uh, framework is, of course, of huge importance to uh, European Union member states, but also to candidate countries, which, which uh, uh, you know, accounts for most of this region. Uh, and, um, of course, the reality is that um, um, case law and uh, a legislative experience uh, in the area of... of, of um, uh, of, of human rights is a little bit longer in Western Europe because of the uh, more recent changes in, in the government uh, system in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Well, that's a, obviously a generalization, but I think there's some, some truth in that. And therefore, um, Central and East European governments and institutions and civil society are newer and, and somewhat less experienced. Um, and there's a need for better organization um, and more dialogue. I think 
I'm thinking here not just of governments actually and, and NGOs, but actually of industry as well. I think industry in our region, in Central and Eastern Europe, is particularly poorly organized um, and uh, doesn't really have a, a tradition of, of dialogue with government about human rights or any other type of policy. And I think that's a, that's a problem which needs to be, needs to be addressed. Uh, I would point to one or two really key elements of the European Union uh, framework, which are, I think, very important for human rights, and they've been touched on uh, here in, in the discussions already, which is um, the intermediary liability regime, which is in the e-commerce directive in the EU framework, and, and of course, net neutrality. Um, more specifically to do with Central and Eastern Europe and, and Southeastern Europe, I think um, there's actually some really interesting potential here in the area of human rights, which is linked to the potential for technological leapfrogging, because Central and Eastern Europe um, have uh, been able already to leapfrog Western Europe in certain areas of, of, of technology development with, with high-speed uh, mobile networks, for example, um, and, and leaving behind technologies like m maybe GPRS and moving straight to, to 3G, for example. And I think it's possible to imagine that this region could also um, leapfrog Western Europe in terms of the application of uh, human rights principles to new technology um, as well. Um, when we think of, of human rights in industry, we um, like to think not just of freedom of speech and privacy, but of all human rights. And I think it's very important to remember that human rights uh, are not absolute. They, they all uh, tend to, to uh, balance and compete against each other. And sometimes uh, your right to freedom of expression is needs to be balanced against your right to security uh, or your right to uh, employment or, or work or your right to, um, to uh, uh, membership of a labor union, for example. Um, so when we think of, of, of human rights, we, we as entrepreneurs, we're members of society like everybody else, and so we have basic notions of what human rights are, uh, but we aren't courts or NGOs and we don't think about human rights every day. Um, so we need help, essentially, to, to, to be responsible players. Um, what we can do is provide analysis for um, policymakers about what the impact of particular rules might be in terms of uh, human rights rules on, on business, and that obviously has an impact itself on human rights. Um, uh, so one example uh, might be the European Union's draft regulation on data protection, which uh, has a huge emphasis on explicit consent for the use of personal data, and the way it's been drafted, which is by privacy lawyers and not by people with experience of compliance and business, uh, will end up incentivizing companies to collect more data and to have a registration and login model for their consumers online because that's the legally compliant way of doing it. It's actually less private than it would otherwise be. So that's the kind of thing that we can do is advise governments about that. Um, I just wanted to come back very quickly on uh, one of the uh, very early um, comments made by Elana about uh, users giving away some of their rights through terms of service. Uh, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I, it strikes me that that's probably legally wrong, isn't it? Uh, I mean, users' rights exist in the law and, and, in, and in, in things like uh, the Convention and, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and there's nothing that you can do in your terms of service which will which will take those rights away, right? I think, I think what you're saying is that users um, make contractual commitments through uh, terms of service, which they may or may not be aware of, which I, I recognize as a problem. But uh, we mustn't also forget that, that terms of service are there um, to protect the businesses and allow them to uh, defend their own rights. And so, for example, if you had an online marketplace which was, which was selling physical goods online, I think it's within your rights to prevent the use of that platform for um, uh, social networking, which would result in, in prostitution, for example. So that's something which um, I think is a legitimate, uh, a legitimate uh, uh, objective of terms of service, which, which is not really um, taking away anybody's uh, rights uh, in a legal sense. Okay, Bogdan or Elvana, do you want to answer? You know, j just to mention the last point, actually that's part of the discussion because talking with, with an NGO that deals with um, 
and this is the colleague politi political work uh, it's sexual workers not prostitutes i just remembered um, Thank you. Um, so he says yes we have the right they have the right to promote their own services as long as they are not illegal so yes there is there is a thing there if if uh, such a marketplace should allow or should not allow a message that is in the limits of the freedom of speech um, and I agree it's a very complicated one. Uh, by the way, in the case that I was mentioning about, they had no limitation in, in place in the, through the terms of service. Okay. Bogdan, Elvana, and then Bogdan. Yes, thank you. When I, when I say that users are giving away their rights by clicking on the okay on the terms of services, I mean that this really becomes the law of the relationship between, this governs the relationship between the user and the internet service provider or the company, the user and other users, the users and the authorities. And in a way, this seems to prevail over human rights law. But the principle of international human rights law is that, in fact, international human rights law prevails over any contractual arrangements. Um, this is the principle. And uh, the users are not aware of this when they are signing up to, to these services and agreeing to the terms of services. This is what I mean uh, when I said um, giving away your rights. Um, for example, privacy. Privacy is, is really the right in question here. Um, um, all the data that Facebook owns about its users, um, really it's, it's the law of Facebook that prevails over, over, over personal data that are, are, are put by users there. It, it's, it, um, and we are having a very hard time trying to enforce privacy laws uh, in that space or whichever other space. Thanks. Before to uh, just to share some thoughts about the issues of giving rights by contractual relations uh, and what Chris says, it's not that simple. It's not that simple at all. Why? Because many times, nor the users, nor the businesses might act in a way that human rights and, pri uh, and privacy rights can be infringed. I will give an example. This is a new realm which, uh, for example, Facebook or other social networks gives. For example, if you tag yourself three times on Facebook that you are next to one area, particular area, you agree to share this information with other people. But what if this area is next to an oncological hospital? New personal data can be collected and not the one that you have given consent of being shared with, you, with the other people. For example, if you share information that, that three uh, months uh, or three times in, in one year you've been to very exotic places uh, in the world, would the tax authorities be interested to know that you have enough uh, uh, income? Would the, 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 the agent, the, the tour operators, will be interested to know that you're a potential client so many new data, personal data, can be processed and gathered for which you have never given a consent to be processed. So uh, the, the European Commission does not have an answer to this question, nor the Council of Europe, nor anyone for the time being, because the way that internet can be used and the services in internet can be used, they overcome the normal, the known conventional way of regulating human rights. And that's what I'm saying, that it requires a different approach. It requires new approach. <laughs> OK, Bogdan, just one sec. Before uh, consent, make user really, really aware and make easy for user. Consent is a very strong word. But the consent is not a real consent when you click the box and from the other side, they can change the term of reference, but you cannot revise. So yeah, they inform you. But if you revise, the only, if you decide not to agree, you have just leave the space. Your data stay, in a way or another. So it's not really true, true, true consent. And users usually do not read all the things that are not written in a human readable kind of way. Bogdan. 
it's in a lawyer readable hard way. Um, so yes, yes, you're right. That that is not a consent according to the data protection rules that we have in place. That is not a consent. But let's look again at the practical things. So we have this case of this young Austrian guy, Max Schrems, who decided to find out what does Facebook collects about him. So he asked Facebook for the data. And Facebook, in a very polite way, gives him all the data that they keeps about him, including messages that he deleted, photos that are not available online, so on and so forth, the data that he keeps deleting. So I said, that's against the EU data protection rules. So we need to go to court. What is the competent court? It's Ireland. So he goes to the data protection authority in Ireland. He loses the case because the data protection authority, in sense, instead of caring about data protection, does not care about data protection in that case. So he says, no, Facebook, it's okay. And then he goes to the appellate court in Ireland, so he needs to, to learn about uh, uh, administrative procedural law in Irish in order to claim his case. And in the end, he gets to the European Court of Justice where the case is he being here now. And this is done by one person that had legal has legal studies. Uh, and he's doing this legal battle for the past, I think, two or three years. So if a regular person is needs to, to do through all this process in order to protect his human right, then I think he doesn't have a human right in this case. And you are talking about citizens of the European Union. Most of us are not citizens of the European Union. And they are completely beyond they are completely beyond the reach. They don't exist. They provide services here. They charge money for uh, advertising, for boosting. They operate in that way but they don't provide any sort of client, customer relationship, client protection, legal protection. There are many cases of violation of human rights on Facebook and they are beyond the reach of any citizen of this yeah. region. But that's also in European Union. In the case of um, Spain, uh, with the data protection authority in Spain, Google Spain had the similar thing. He said, we are not providing services in Spain for um, whatever for the search thing. Yes, so I said we are not protecting services. It's true that the Data Protection Authority and then the European Court of Justice said no, because you're collecting the personal data of the Spanish people, because you are, are providing Google AdWords services to, to the Spanish people, then it means that you have a local presence, so you need to abide by the Spanish laws and the European laws by extension. No, please. Yeah, just uh, one um, point about, about business reality for us, and another point about um, about uh, jurisdiction, which I know is a completely different topic, which will be discussed, I'm sure, extensively at Eurodig and in, indeed um, in the Internet Governance Forum. But um, first of all, um, when I came here this morning, I got up extremely early in Brussels and drove to uh, Brussels Airport and parked in the secure parking lot at Brussels Airport. And I signed a contract there, which I did not read. Um, but I'm sure there were terms in that contract which committed me to uh, certain things, such as perhaps not drawing graffiti on the walls to uh, express my political views uh, within the confines of the, of the parking lot. Um, so I think it's quite legitimate for that business, which is the, the parking lot company, to expect that when I use their service on their property, that I'm going to behave in a certain way which meets their business objectives, which is to keep a parking lot which is clean and safe for other car users. And it's, I think it's the same for, for an online marketplace or for a classified ad site or whatever. You should be able to set certain conditions for, for what the service is for and how others are going to use it. So secondly, the point about, that you're making about, about companies being beyond the reach of, of national jurisdiction or indeed European Union jurisdiction. The European Union is currently trying to solve this problem in the data protection area specifically by simply writing a provision in the new data protection regulation which says, we have jurisdiction over any company that targets European uh, residents. That's, I think, actually very dangerous. If we think about it, uh, we think about this a lot as a company which has operations in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Russia, Turkey, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, and lots of other interesting countries. Um, if you think about that model of jurisdiction over, over the internet, um, and you imagine that being copied by other countries uh, outside of Europe or even within Europe, which are, which are um, politically unpopular within the European Union, uh, and they used the, that model of jurisdiction just because they said so in their law, 
uh, to apply to, to companies uh, inside the European Union, we would have, not only would we have chaos in terms of jurisdiction on the internet, but we would also potentially be finding that European companies were being forced to comply with laws in countries where European politicians didn't want them to be complying with those laws. So we need to be very, very careful when we play with jurisdiction on the internet. Done. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, I think we are generalizing a little bit uh, the uh, terms of service or um, the terms of service or the contractual terms um, issue here, because not all terms of services are the same for all service providers. That's clear. Um, the point, at least, I'm trying to make is that these should be clear and accessible uh, for internet users. And most, um, most importantly, they should be compliant with human rights, with international human rights law. And this is not just a choice that companies can or cannot make. Uh, companies have a corporate social responsibility. Uh, there are um, agreed um, uh, texts on, 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 there are guiding principles on corporate social responsibility and, and the terms of service should, uh, should be inspired and should integrate these principles. Um, to make this, uh, this very concrete, first of all, information, uh, giving information to the user about the activities that service providers are, are taking which impact uh, fundamental rights and freedoms. This is the first uh, element. The second is the due process. Informing and if there are questions by the users, there should be a process uh, of, of, um, of responding to, to the questions that users have. There, there, there should be a mechanism to address um, allegations of human rights violations by users. These are the elements which, which would, would, would be integrated in terms of services for them to be compliant with, uh, with, with human rights law. And, and which do not exist, <laughs> uh, and, and that's that's exactly the, the point. Because yes, you're right. The, a company may issue their own terms of conditions, but those terms that do not need to breach imperative laws. And to give you an example that I'm sure you'll agree with me, we have the right the cooling off period for if you buy an item online, you you may uh, during 14 days to to give it back. So you may not have a terms and condition which says no, you do not have 14 days. You have 10 days or five days or no right at all. And it should be the same thing with human rights. But whereas in the contractual law and, and consumer protection law, things are much more clearly because it's black and white. On human rights, these things are usually uh, in the best case scenario left uh, for the uh, for the pure um, uh, consideration by the companies, which raises other issues if they have the competencies, as you already mentioned. Hi. Um, I was going to come later to, to, to mention some of the guidelines that the Council of Europe has done. And, and what you just mentioned, Elvana, I did a question in my mind. You know, the Council of Europe has done some really good guidelines over the past decade in explaining quite pragmatically uh, how, for instance, application developers or internet service providers should apply human rights according to European human rights uh, framework in their day-to-day -day practices. And I think having uh, practical guides on implementation is, is a really useful because very often the companies don't know better, frankly, and, and they need that explanation. So really helpful and for those that, that are not aware, please go to the, the Council of Europe website to have a look. I mean, at what you just said about terms of service and, and having human rights considerations in them and, and, and the processes uh, about human rights uh, that, that it was entailed just raises a question in my mind, which is, you know, okay, we're talking about Facebook, okay, we're talking about some of the big platforms out there. <coughs> but the vast majority of online companies are tiny outfits. They usually don't even have a lawyer. They probably outsource the writing of their terms of service. So how realistic and pragmatic is it that we're going to ask them, if I understood correctly, that not only do they have terms of service that recognize human rights, which might be okay, but then that you might have a special contact point at a startup to deal with human rights related queries that you might have for instance, as I've heard others suggested, you might have a human rights audit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you have startups of 10 people, which is the case for a lot of the European companies in that space, how realistic can it be? Or can we think of pragmatic ways of, of addressing these issues for you know 95% of the companies in this environment, which are tiny companies with no, not nearly the same resources as a Facebook or Google or, or others? Uh, 
Or who want to comment? I'll try to give a, um, a negative answer, actually. <laughs> because I think that if Google or Facebook will start implementing that, the other companies will copy their practice in, in, in a lot of instances. And when people see that the big guys are not doing that, you will never be uh, in, in a position to, uh, to do the same thing. Well, if, if Google doesn't do it, why should I do it as a small startup? That's one answer that I would give. The second one is that when you have a startup, like you have any kind of company, you need to do a, a properly due diligence process to understand that the market where you operate, what, does, what implication do they have? Maybe it has data protection implications. Maybe you have freedom of expression implications. Maybe you have no implication whatsoever because you don't collect any data. So this is also a diligence of the companies that also exist in the real world. It's not just the, 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 the IT world. So I think it's also need to be more due diligence process by, by the startups. And actually, a lot of the uh, incubators and accelerators are working with, with lawyers on pro bono basis or other basis in order to ensure that this is, uh, I mean, at least they have the basic information about it. Ivana, while I'm going there, thank to you. Um, I think that's a very good point uh, you're making there. Um, companies may not always have the uh, resources to invest in, in, in this. Um, and it's not for the Council of Europe really to, 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 to guide the companies uh, how to develop a business model which includes this in uh, this consideration in the business model. But thinking, um, thinking with my, my human ra uh, rights head on, um, considering human rights impact and implications can be a bus business advantage for businesses as well. So uh, this may actually enhance their business model. It may not be only a cost, uh, which is, uh, has nothing in return, but it may, may enhance their, their model. Um, I, I remember a, a statement by the uh, Twitter CEO a couple of years back saying that um, uh, human rights, freedom of expression and privacy are a business advantage for that company. Um, so the company cared about these two values and, and uh, and justified the investment in it. Um, I think the role of, of INGOs, um, which I represent, or the NGOs, is to, uh, to, to speak about human rights all the time, so the, that these are on the table. These, uh, this is a consideration on the table for, for internet companies as well, and it's not forgotten. Um, and, and this is our role to promote uh, our standards so that once business decides to include this in, in its model, in its profit model, we are there to also provide the expertise um, how this can be done in a way which is compliant with uh, international human rights, not in w whichever way would be thought uh, appropriate, but in a way which complies really with international human rights law. Mm. Оксана Приходько, Ukraine. I would like to raise uh, the issue of uh, unreasonable blocking of accounts in social networks, first of all in Facebook. Uh, can anybody uh, comment um, court cases maybe or any judicial movement in this uh, direction? So account is blocked. Uh, unreasonable block. Uh, I researched this issue and uh, I can give you example um, regarding breastfeeding pictures uh, in Facebook. Uh, this issue was uh, solved uh, without court decision, but uh, uh, because of political reasons, there are some unreasonable blocking and what to do with this problem. Thank you. Any volunteer? I can give some ideas on how this issue should be answered. At least I will try doing so. Uh, indeed, uh, as, a fa as Facebook is a cross-border service, it is very difficult to answer uh, in one only way this question because it very much depends on the particular jurisdiction and to what extent the local laws protect the local users. Because many times, as, uh, uh, as our colleagues said, said it is, uh, there are a set of imper uh, imperative rules 
which protect the users, they can overcome and they have a prevailing application to the contractual rules. So the question is not that easy to answer. Uh, uh, yes, it is true that when you have an account at Facebook, you, you, sign, you have a contract with Facebook and you agree with the terms of service where it is explicitly envisaged that no content that can, uh, with explicit uh, nudity, at uh, pornographic, at whatever, should be posted. And in such a case, Facebook has a sole discretion to, to, to block uh, the service and to stop providing the service. So it's a pure contractual uh, breach of contract, and anyone can seek uh, remedy if can <laughs> if uh, can prove uh, if can prove of course damages so practically uh, this is based mostly on contractual nature so it's a breach of contract but if there is uh, blocking based on other person's uh, uh, advice notice for example someone sees that his own pictures are posted on another account then comes a very <laughs> another difficult issue is Facebook obliged to block this content, which is uh, which is uh, which is uh, uh, which is stored on another profile, not on the person whose rights were uh, uh, who are, who are affected? Then, uh, well, in Europe, it is uh, more or less the same way treated. Uh, usually, Facebook, as an in internet uh, information site, is service provider, and his uh, his uh, obligations are based on the European Directive. 2031 uh, on the information society services, then it is obliged to uh, block the content in any time where it receives a notice that other people's rights are infringed. If he fails to do so, he will be liable as, as a company for infringing the rights of that person. So it is, it is, uh, it is, it is very difficult uh, to, to have one and the same answer because in different jurisdictions things are the same, well, for example, countries outside Europe, they, they treat it a different way. So I hope this well, makes some I, clarity. I will, uh, just say, I will give an answer about the culture that is in the internet. Many of the things that are put down answer to a culture. Because nudity is a very subjective, it's a culture related. So who decides about what? And it's very often easy to put the burden on the local a small ISP and say, if you don't do this, if you don't, do, you don't take down, I will find you and you will close down your business. So the big boys, the big guy, and they're really guy, they use these things. There is a culture of impunity. And this is what about uh, those big guys don't comply with rules. If they do not comply, why should the, the smaller one? But there is a culture. The internet is not a neutral space. It's the space of political beliefs, of stereotypes, prejudice, and the mainstream one decide for everyone, and the mainstream one are very m much often into a Western society. Also, not only the North Europe, but beyond. Just the last intervention, and then we need uh, to have a wrap-up and a rapporteur. I will, I will ask audience. I don't want to ask them. They are experts on this. Simple user, uh, as uh, simple users, uh, how many terms of service or, uh, did you read? Okay, so just the last, uh, the last round, okay. one sentence, how to connect, if it's possible, to connect this theor theoretical approach with our realities so that the users are really empowered. So uh, I think it's very simple to apply the law. So this guy, Mark Zuckerberg, makes billions of euros with personal data of the European citizens, and he doesn't comply with the European data protection law. So I'm sorry, that's a simple issue. Apply the law. Um, what we are doing is um, trying to bring uh, the, the document I was talking about, the guide uh, to human rights for internet users, to the users themselves, so that they read it. And we are translating it in multiple languages. We're also trying to mainstream it in our uh, activities that we organize in, in specific countries in, in Europe, in our member states, in, in Southeastern Europe as well. 
um, in activities with, um, with, with media actors, with journalists, with judges, with prosecutors, so that we raise awareness about the, the need to implement uh, human rights um, and, uh, and, and to, to, to become aware of, of what they mean. Um, Perhaps now I'm coming back to a point that was made earlier here on the importance of and the impact that a soft law instrument such as this one can have. Actually, these documents may seem as trivial, and uh, yes, when governments go back after to, 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 to their capitals after approving this, it doesn't mean that the first thing they will do is to implement it. Um, but these documents do have an impact. The European Court of Human Rights usually refers to these documents. It finds guidance in them how to settle conflictual situations, um, how to deliver a judgment. It refers to these instruments. And really, uh, uh, this, this is a, a value of, of, uh, that proves the value of, of these documents. Um, again, as I said, we, we promote uh, standards in, in all our cooperation activities. We promote implementation of standards. So, so my closing line would be implementation, implementation, implementation. Thank you. Yeah. Very quick um, um, advice, please read the terms of service. Do not just click yes, 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 agree, agree. Read and then agree, <laughs> and this is first. Second, uh, I definitely believe that uh, the, the technologies and internet, they develop so quickly that the law is, is uh, standing behind. It cannot grasp and regulate in appropriate way the protection of human rights on the internet. So it should, there should be mechanisms to be adapted more quickly. So uh, initiatives like uh, these of Council of Europe are very, very, uh, very nice uh, approach. But as uh, as Bogdan said, they are not a law. So uh, usually the law is the one that gives the the scope of of of, the, of what can be done and what can't be done. Thank you. Chris. Uh, I'm going to be somewhat controversial and question whether there really is a difference between human rights on the internet and off the internet. So I'm, I'm, oui. I'm not sure whether there really is. Um, and, and close with a, um, the thought that it's really not easy for uh, internet companies to know uh, how to deal with human rights. I'll give you one case study which was from the revolution in Egypt uh, when Yahoo, which runs Flickr, found itself confronted with requests for removal of um, some pictures of, which have been placed of um, members of the Egyptian security service um, with some uh, messages about how they should be chased down and, and found and brought to justice. And uh, Yahoo uh, didn't know whether it should uh, take these uh, images down and the associated messages down because they were an incitement to violence uh, or whether it should uh, keep them up because that would be a uh, protection of freedom of speech. So you have people's physical security, um, uh, their rights of defense in a court of law being placed, um, being balanced against uh, the freedom of speech and in, in a very charged political context. Now that's an extreme example. Hopefully we're not gonna see an Egyptian revolution every day here in Sofia, but uh, it's just, uh, it's a good one, I think. Arade. So now human rights for internet users on the level between uh, philosophy and law. And we need to put that uh, topic on next level between law and procedures. M possibility to implement rules, cl clear rules to resolve any mentioned problems here. Thank you. So now our rapporteur, Valentina Pavel. So to Valentina, you had too many. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. So in short, I have uh, around four or five bullet points. Uh, the first would be um, human rights apply online as well as offline, but we need to shift the discussion from the theoretical sphere into the practical one. Uh, could I have a show of hands for those who disagree? <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, therefore, we need to consider human rights compliance guidelines for all actors, industry, government, and users. Okay. Um, second idea would be we need to take into consideration the online protection of all human rights, not just privacy and uh, access to information, for example. 
show of hands for those who disagree. That's the basic rule for this session. Um, there's a lack of awareness over users' human rights. Um, for example, international human rights law prevails contractual relationships. Jurisdiction represents an important element for human rights enforcement. Uh, states as well as business should have efficient and comprehensive mechanisms for human rights redress. Um, we should consider um, the snowball effect. If one big company will adopt um, human rights conduct, it will set the market requirements for all the others. Okay. We will um, revise this. Um, and last, more focus should be awarded to finding modalities for connecting the theoretical approach um, with the practical realities. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much. You earn your break. <laughs> Thanks very much. Half an hour, I think.